Um, good afternoon or good morning or maybe even good evening. Um, I just wanted to, my name is Trish Lebosky or Patricia Lebosky. I think the next slide, yeah, that shows my mug shot. Um, I just wanted to welcome you all to this webinar and just give you a little bit of orientation as to why we're doing this and, and what you're going to hear over the next hour. So as many of you know, the NIH has a very strong commitment to development of the future biomedical research workforce. It's something that is studied and modeled and analyzed routinely at the NIH. So a couple years ago, 2012, a special working group of the advisory committee to the NIH director published a report that showed quite clearly something that probably a lot of us knew already, but that a large proportion of the biomedical research trainees, both graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, were interested, were really interested in careers outside academic research, um, many of those career paths we'll talk about today. So, However, even though the trainees were interested in these careers and they were ending up in those places, they were getting jobs there, it became obvious that most of their academic mentors would not have either the contacts or perhaps knowledge to facilitate the movement of their trainees into those different career paths. And that's okay. The NIH recognizes this. And so therefore, one NIH effort directed at helping trainees is to that we set up these BEST experiments. BEST stands for Broadening Experiences in Scientific Training. And we set up these experiments in which many, 17 universities are testing ways to help augment the training of their grad students and postdocs to include, it depends, different, different universities are doing it differently, but they include things like career development, professional development, and and um, maybe internships, externships, just different job exposure approaches to help them prepare them for that diverse workforce that they're likely to encounter. So that's, that's where the NIH is coming from at this point with this experiment. So this BEST consortium is partnering with ASBMB to pilot this at least three-part webinar series this summer. And this is the second one of the three. It's as you saw earlier, it's called Charting a Course to Career Success. Please know there's one more coming up on um, building professional relationships, pragmatic advice for the human scientists. Um, so that one's coming up next month. So you can go back to the ASBMB website and read about that. So the moderators, um, the academic moderators here today, Cynthia Furman and Patrick Brandt, are affiliated with two of the best sites. Um, at UMass Medical School and University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, respectively. So um, again, thanks for joining us. I hope this information is going to be useful for you. Please know that when you sign off, there's going to be a short survey on this webinar. So please, if you have time, five minutes, please answer the questions for us. We're going to use that input to help design future webinars in this area. And it's really important that we know what, what we should keep doing and what we should change. So now I'm going to hand off to Suzanne Barber, who is representing ASBMB at the moment. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, greetings from Athens, Georgia. My name is Suzanne Barber. I'm on the Education and Professional Development Committee of the ASBMB, and we're co-sponsoring this series of webinars together with the NIH. Um, one bit of business before I go further, just to let you know that this is um, going to be recorded and it will be available after the, um, after the webinar concludes. So I'm very excited to introduce you to our two facilitators this afternoon. Um, I'll introduce you first to Dr. Cynthia Furman. She's Assistant Dean um, and of Career and Professional Development in, um, and Assistant Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Pharmacology in the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Massachusetts um, Medical School. And um, there she founded and directs the Center for Biomedical Career Development. Um, she's principal investigator of grants from the NIH and the Burroughs Welcome Fund, and she leads efforts to integrate career planning and professional development programs into the PhD programs and postdoctoral experiences at the University of Massachusetts. Um, she transitioned to the University of Massachusetts from the University of California, San Francisco, where she founded the Preparing Future Faculty Program, and there she oversaw professional skills programs for biomedical biomedical scientists. 
And in 2011, she published the first study to ever look at the career preferences of doctoral and postdoctoral students in the basic biomedical sciences and how these preferences differed based on the year of training. Um, she also, very importantly, co-authored My IDP, which you hopefully know is an interactive career planning website that has more than 100,000 users and is hosted on the AAAS website. Um, so we'll be very excited to hear what um, Dr. Furman has to share with us this afternoon. Our other facilitator is Dr. Patrick Brandt. He's Director of Career Development and Training at the, UN, at the University of North Carolina. And he's co-PI on, co on the Immersion Program to Advance Career Training. That's called IMPACT. That's one of these NIH best uh, programs that you've just heard about. Um, through that mechanism, he's involved in career exploration, exploration job, job shadowing, and an internship program that serves almost 1,000 graduate students and postdocs at the University of North Carolina. He also directs career awareness and professional skills development programming through training initiatives in the biological and biomedical sciences. And this is UNC's professional development program for life sciences graduate students. He was instrumental in securing um, over $5 million in grant funding to support these and other related initiatives. Um, so we'll be very excited to hear what Dr. Brandt has to tell us this afternoon as well. And we hope you get a lot out of this webinar. Um, with that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Furman, who will move forward with the webinar. Cynthia, we can't hear you. Ah, thank you very much. <laughs> I was effectively using the mute button. Uh, thanks for the reminder, Trish. Yep. Uh, well, I want to welcome everybody. It looks like we have 107 uh, callers as part of this webinar right now, and I'm sure we'll have a few more people um, jumping in as the hour progresses. This is really about charting your, your career. Um, and I'm going to make the assumption that most of you are graduate students or postdocs, though I'm very aware that there might be undergraduate students on the call, mid-career professional scientists on the call, and um, all of you are welcome. And thinking about your career in this deliberate way um, applies to you no matter what stage of your training or career you're in. Um, so as a graduate student or postdoc, let's say, um, you should hopefully be posing to your question, yourself the question, you know, how can you position yourself best for the next professional step? You have years of training that you're doing right now, um, and there are many things that you can do, some of which are more time intensive, some of which really are not time intensive, to really chart yourself forward towards success. <clears throat> Uh, so number one is your research progress. It doesn't matter if you're planning to be a scientist at the bench in, in your next role or if you plan to move away from the bench and have a scientific role um, in another way. Um, anyone who is getting their PhD or the postdoctoral training will be expected to have made strong progress in their research. So that's a number one thing you should be focusing on, absolutely. But there's also skills, your skill development. And when we think about skills, there's a lot of different skills you should be thinking about. Number one, we might be thinking about the technical skills that we're developing. Right? If I want to move into this discipline, scientific discipline, maybe I need these additional technical skills. And that's, of course, extremely important. But through the interview process um, and to be successful in the job, you're going to need to be able to demonstrate and use a variety of other professional skills, writing skills, presentation skills, but also really importantly, skills related to managing projects and working with people, either managing up, right, understanding how to work with a supervisor, how to work with your mentor as a student or postdoc effectively, um, and also supervising others. Many of you will go into roles where you'll soon be supervising others. Um, these professional skills are very important no matter what you will do. For example, if you want to create um, or establish your own lab uh, in an academic position, you will be um, supervising, hiring people and supervising people right away. Um, and many junior faculty reflect also that these are key skills that they'd wish they'd worked on more deliberately while they were in training. And then there's career planning. Career planning is very important. You can be developing these skills, um, but it's um, even more effective if you can have some focus on as to where you think you might want to go longer term in your career. What's the next major career step that you want to take? And by that I don't mean, well, as a graduate student I think I'll do a postdoc. It's more about what do you want to do beyond your training and how can you select that next step or move directly into that career path? What do you need to do to get there? Um, so having a sense of that will help you identify whether you do need to develop some job-specific skills or job-specific experience or establish a network, meet more people in that career path that you're interested in, or that scientific field that you're interested in, or even find mentorship in that field, mentors who are familiar with that field or in them directly. 
Um, and so thinking about this way ahead of time, not just a couple months before you're going on a job search, is very important. This, these things take time. But the number one question, right, when you, when you think about that, um, and, and Patrick's going to talk about also having a couple of different career paths in mind for this, right? So if you're doing all of this, um, that's a lot to take in, and it can feel pretty overwhelming. And it's most important, of course, that you're um, progressing in your research productivity. And so this is where an individual development plan can be very, very helpful. This idea that you be strategic about how you spend your time um, and creating a plan and sticking to it or identifying the right times when it's better to deviate from your plan, but making deliberate decisions about that in a targeted, focused, strategic fashion. It's best to do this starting early in your training if you can. Um, if you're not early in your training, jump in now. Right? And this is something that you'll do throughout your career. It's best if you have a sense of your long-term career goals or start to bring focus to that so that you can do some of this career-specific um, preparation as well. Um, and you're going to need to be able to advocate for yourself and seek out the mentorship you need. And having, thinking through these things um, and thinking through what your gaps are, where, what you need to achieve, how you're going to do that will help you advocate for yourself effectively in this way. So what we're going to talk about in this webinar um, is, you know, I'll briefly define what an IDP is, and then Patrick's going to um, talk with you about defining your long-term career goals, um, identifying your gaps, um, gaps in experience, skills, your network, etc., and then setting goals to address your gaps. Um, I'm going to give some tips on following through on your plan, and we'll end by um, I can very briefly walk you through some features in my IDP that you may or may not know about if you want to use that as an online tool to put a framework around your planning. Um, but I just want to say up front that this is a webinar. It's actually very brief. Um, you know, many of the best institutions are teaching full courses on the career planning at UMass Medical School. We have a required course for our third year students where we go through this in multiple lessons. Um, so we're going to give you a brief overview, but try to highlight some things that perhaps some of you may not have thought of before. So what is an individual development plan really? You've probably heard this buzzword. Um, and, um, and you know, I think it really, the word can describe what it is. It is a plan. And it's for you. So each plan is going to be different for each person. And it's a plan that you create yourself. So your mentor doesn't hand you a plan and say this is what you need to do. It's about you reflecting on how you want to grow, um, what progress you want to make in your research, and of course that you would discuss with your mentor. But also what are your gaps? What skills do you need to work on? And how do you need to move forward in your career preparation? And it's about you then creating, defining what actions you'll take maybe in the next year um, maybe even longer if you want to think bigger picture, um, to move yourself towards um, the career path that you want to move towards. Um, so the first picture here of an IDP, I don't expect you to be able to read these. You can download it from our website. It's just an example at career.umassmed.edu. We have a section called Navigate your, with a Plan. Um, but as you can see, I call this kind of a thematic um, IDP where there's, um, this person has identified that they want to write and submit a paper, attend a conference, develop some technical skills, and then they defined actions for each of those that they're going to take to accomplish those goals. So it's not just about saying, I want to improve my writing skills. It's about really thoughtfully thinking about, how am I going to do that this year? What actions will I take? Another way that people sometimes take these is take the thematic IDP and convert it into a chronological IDP. So taking your action plan and writing it down maybe by semester, what will you be working on, maybe by month, um, maybe drawing it on a timeline. So there's a lots of different ways to make your plan, and you can do it the way that works best for you. So I'm going to transition to Patrick now. And Patrick, don't forget to unmute yourself as I did. Um, to talk about um, thinking about your long-term uh, career goals and your gaps. Thanks, Cynthia. Can everybody hear me okay? You're a bit on the low side, Patrick. Okay. All right. I'll try to step a little closer to the phone. Um, okay. So um, thank you, Cynthia, for that um, background information already. And so this slide that, or the slide that's up right now is one that uh, kind of encapsulates the three-step process to career um, planning. Uh, and we'll talk about each one of these steps in more detail over the next few minutes. Uh, in this next part of the, of the workshop, I'll be focusing mostly on what could be considered the career development side of an individual development plan. So as Cynthia mentioned in the last couple of slides where she actually showed some pictures of 
uh, career or of IDPs. Um, an important part of your IDP is your um, project goals and your. Pro um, but we'll, mostly, what I'll be talking about over the next few slides is figuring out what your career goals are and what your career um, plans are. So this three-step process is an iterative process that happens throughout your career. So whether you are a grad student or an undergrad or a postdoc or a, uh, a, a, a new career professional, uh, this, these steps will um, relate to you. So the first step is to define what it is that you want to do, define a plan A. And we, I used to call it a plan B, but uh, I now call it a plan A prime. So we'll talk about what, um, why, that, why that distinction. The second step is going to be to identify the gaps in your skill set or your qualifications. And then the third step is to set goals to bridge those gaps. And so those are highlighted here by these three pictures. So first, if I can get, OK, here we go. All right, so step one is to define your plan A and your plan A prime. And I like this picture of the kid in the candy shop because despite what Oftentimes, uh, there's a pessimism about the careers that are available to PhD uh, trained scientists. But there really are lots and lots of options. Uh, the, um, Cynthia's My IDP process is really good at, at helping you to figure out what many of those options are. And we'll talk about some of those in, in the next slide. But there are lots of options. Uh, and so really, your career plan should be based on your interests and your preferences. And they'll be influenced, of course, by things like geographic constraints, uh, the compensation needs, work environment preferences, and family issues. And so the reason that I don't like to say plan A and a plan B is because plan B denotes or rep implies that it's a, a second-rate plan. Really what we want you to do in this process uh, of career development is we want each of you to have two or maybe even three different career paths that you're equally excited about. Because you never know what the job market is going to be like or the, what the timing is going to be like when you're ready for your next step. And it's important to have those two uh, plans in place and be prepared for two different plans, whichever your career, whichever way your career um, progresses. So how can we define, how can you figure out what your career goals are, or what, your, what your plan A and your plan B would, is? Um, it's easy to say this first bullet point, know yourself, that's easy to say, but it's hard to do. Um, my I, the My IDP process that Cynthia will be talking more about at the, um, in the last third of the, of the workshop does a great job and, and actually has three different assessments, a skills assessment, a values assessment, and an interest assessment. And that's a great start for figuring out what it is that is important to you. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can research career options. Many of you probably talk with friends and colleagues already about the different types of careers that they are in or that they are um, pursuing. And hopefully you've heard of this concept of an informational interview. Uh, briefly, that's just having a conversation with somebody who's in a career that's of interest to you. It usually works best if there's someone who's maybe three to five years ahead of you in, your career, in their career path. And it's an opportunity to not necessarily ask for a job, but to ask for information about how they got to where they are, what they like about their position, uh, what, they would, what advice they would give to somebody who wants to follow in their footsteps. And then with um, a basic idea of what you're interested in doing, you can plan activities during your training period, whether that's your PhD or your postdoc, that will help to validate those career plans. That might include an internship. It might include um, career shadowing. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we'll talk about a little bit later. And then, as I mentioned before, this is an iterative process. And it's important to reevaluate periodically and look for patterns that might reflect a career interest that you hadn't identified before that, that's changing. One piece of advice that I remember getting uh, when I was trying to decide what it is that I wanted to do, because I, like many of you, came through with a PhD, back, PhD science background uh, and had a decision uh, to make as, as what career I would follow. And the advice that I was given is to look back at my CV and look at the times when I was most excited or when I was most energized. Uh, look at the activities that I was doing when I was, that I, I felt um, that I was doing the best. Uh, and so that's a piece of advice that I, I can pass on to you as well. You can also 
um, pay attention to what others compliment you on, and the skills and the knowledge and the, and the abilities that others value in you are good ones to keep honing. Okay, so right now, I know that you haven't had a, a lot of time to think about it in this workshop, but I, hopefully some of you have um, identified uh, a plan A at least, a, and hopefully a plan A prime for yourselves as well. So in this um, poll, what we'd like you to do is to select the options that are closest to your plan A and your plan A prime. So you can pick two um, of these options. And your selections will remain anonymous, and once you submit your uh, answers, then you'll be able to see the results uh, in real time. So I'll give everybody a moment to do this. Also, if you have any questions for the speakers throughout the webinar, you're welcome to type those into the chat box. Thank you. So we're at about three quarters, a little bit, a little bit shy of three quarters of the total responses. So if you have the ability to uh, fill, this, uh, fill out the survey or the poll that's on the screen, that would be great. So I'm seeing a, a clear um, a clear winner here. We've got lots of people who are interested in research uh, intensive careers in academia or government. Uh, the close second uh, research intensive careers in industry. Uh, these are ones that people tend to know a lot about because they uh, they're, people have been going into these different types of careers for a long time. Uh, there are lots of careers that are out there that might not be as that you may not be as familiar with. And the My IDP tool that Cynthia will talk more about is a great learning opportunity for figuring out what some of these are. I see lots of people interested in research administration, and um, that would include positions like a grant officer at NIH, for example, or a program director leading a career development office or an office of postdoctoral affairs. And some people Patrick, interested. Please. Yes, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to say we have a question. Let me know when you'd like me to ask it. Now is a good time. Oh, Samuel asks, where can I go to get that mentorship you were just speaking of? Um, so I think maybe what the, the question is is where can they find, is there, is there more clarification about what type of mentorship they might be asking about? I think you just spoke about getting mentorship um, in the previous slide. Samuel, if you want to clarify your question for Patrick, if you could type that into the chat box, that would be great. But no other uh, clarification, clarification was given so far. Okay. Um, well, one one thing uh, to keep in mind is that um, your your principal investigator or your research mentor uh, should be and usually is a great source of information, a great source of mentorship. Uh, other places that you can go to find mentorship, whether that's career mentorship or um, project mentorship or people in your, on your committee, um, especially career mentorship, uh, a great way to find those people who are willing to help are, is by doing informational interviewing. Um, any types of, uh, any kind of network th networking that you can do is going to be um, helpful in finding those uh, career and professional mentors throughout your time. There, Patrick, was Samuel there a clarification on that question? There is, yes. He was asking for if, if there are any, any external resources outside of universities, and I think you did just mention that information interviews are a good way. Um, but I will uh, also men, uh, mention the NRMN, um, the National Research Mentoring Network. Mm -hmm. That may be a good resource as well. And I don't know if you know any others, Patrick. Yeah. Um, and again, per, perhaps there's lots of other great sources of information about career mentoring. Um, one of the preeminent ones is sciencecareers.org. Uh, and so besides just housing the MyIDP tool, they have lots and lots of articles about all these different types of careers. And so that's one that I would suggest. And ASBMB has information too. Erica, do you want to mention anything about that? 
about mentoring. Um, we do offer mentoring through a grant writing program that we have. Um, the program just happened, though, so you'll have to look for the next grant writing program next year. Um, but obviously, professional societies are a great way to find mentors um, by attending their meetings, whether it's regional meetings or annual meetings. Um, this is a great way to seek out mentors in your field as well. Great. So moving back to the poll results then, um, hopefully everybody can see those on your screen. Um, let's move on to the next step in this process, which is once you have a sense of, of what career or what career paths you're aiming for, it's important to figure out what are your, the skills that you have now that are relevant to that career path, and also what are the gaps that are um, in your skill set. Uh, and so this is not a difficult concept to, to get your head around. You've got your background and experience, and then there's the requirements of your dream job, and what's keeping you from that dream job is the gap in your uh, skill set and the, and the gap in your knowledge and your abilities. And so how, what are some ways that we can identify that skill gap? One easy way is to review job advertisements. Even if you're far from the job hunt itself, I always encourage trainees to be looking for um, job ad advertisements that, are, that sound interesting to them. Review those advertisements and figure out what they're looking for uh, and, and see how you match up. You can also ask hiring managers of positions that you're interested in what they're looking for. And Hiring managers are great people to do informational interviews with because they have lots of um, first-hand information about candidates that were successful in getting uh, positions like the ones that you're interested in. And they can also give you advice about what to avoid or, or what not to do. Um, bullet point number three there is uh, we've already discussed. And then if you are on the job market uh, and most of us who are on the job market don't have uh, first uh, perfect luck when we first apply for a position, and so we get lots of experience with having unsuccessful applications and unsuccessful interviews. And it can be difficult to go back to those uh, people who, per who did the interview to seek feedback, but it's a, a, a very important part of the process of figuring out, um, asking them for advice about what you could have done differently or, or what, was the re what were the reasons that they chose a different candidate over you. I want to pause for a second. I, I can see that there's some questions coming in. Erica, you've had, or, or has someone else had a chance to um, look at any questions and see if there's some? Um, Patrick, yeah. I've been watching the questions and I can answer one while you take a look at them as well. Um, okay. Some of these questions are pretty specific, and Patrick and I can stay after the webinar. I can stay as long as a half an hour after the webinar, and we can type in answers or stay to. Um, you know, answer them verbally if you like. Um, but maybe we can hit some more general ones that we think will apply to more people. One person asked about um, that it was difficult to set up a job shadowing experience and that people haven't been responding. Um, I would suggest that um, when you reach out kind of cold to somebody, often they're not going to respond. Um, if someone reached out to me to ask if they could job shadow me, I might say no because I haven't met them. I don't know what that would be like for a full day or whatever it would be. Um, but what I would suggest doing, uh, and maybe you've tried this, but I'm just going to provide it as an answer, I would suggest um, first asking for just an informational interview, maybe even as short as half an hour conversation or an hour conversation about their career experience. If the informational interview goes well, then you can ask if, if it seems like it would be valuable to you, you know, if you might be able to job shadow and what would that look like for their type of um, position. Um, and again, it may be possible, it may not be for different types of roles. Um, uh, to get increase your chances of having someone respond back, see if someone you can try to reach out to people who are somehow um, related to your network, um, people either that you already know or people who know people you know, and maybe that intermediate person can introduce you via email. And often, as a favor to that person, the person will respond and meet with you. Um, Patrick, do you want to continue with the next slide and we can answer a couple more questions while people are filling out the poll? Yeah. Oh, I can just I, I agree, oh. and I could just briefly say someone asked about what it is an informational interview. Um, I think Patrick answered this, but just to make sure everyone's clear because it's so important. Um, it's a time when just a conversation with someone where you ask them about their career. You know, how have, you know, what do you do day to day? What is your current role like? How did you get there? You know, how did you make career decisions? People like talking about themselves, and it's a really great way to connect with someone, to, to get to know them better, for them to get to know you a little bit, but also for you to learn about that type of role. 
And this is Trish. I would add that if you do that, you should go in with some very specific questions. Um, yes, you're right. People love to talk about themselves and their jobs. But if you just go and you say, tell me about what you do, sometimes that's not so great. So be very professional about it and have a few half a dozen questions that you can build that conversation around. Definitely. And when I come to the My IDP part of this talk, uh, later on in the talk, um, I'll show you where you can get some resources on um, how to learn more about informational interviews and how to structure one and prepare for one. Great. Thank you. So um, the, the slide that's up right now is another poll. Uh, and as Cynthia mentioned earlier on, we're trying to compress into a one-hour workshop uh, the same amount of, uh, or the, the same range of content that is sometimes uh, dedicated, a whole course might be dedicated to this. And so um, you haven't had a whole lot of time to think about what your, what your skill gaps might be or what your gaps might be that are preventing you from being ready right now for your, your dream job. But some common ones are listed on the, uh, on the screen. And you can choose, please go ahead and choose your top three. Uh, and then once you submit your answers, you'll be able to see the aggregate responses from others in, on the call. Patrick, while people are doing that, would you like to answer another question? Yes. So Jessica asks, would it be more beneficial to do an informational interview with someone who's three to five years ahead of you in regard to career, or someone who's a director or head of a department? So I have found I found that somebody who is three to five years ahead of you is much more likely to uh, agree to an informational interview. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, that's a good place to start. Um, if you can do an informational interview with somebody higher up, then that is also great and you'll get different kinds of information. Sometimes if, you, if things change are changing so quickly uh, in the biomedical career landscape, that sometimes the path that somebody who has taken to a, a, a career that's of interest to you, who did it over the last 20 years, for example, could be radically different than what's available now or what's even recommended now. And so that's another reason that I suggest starting with um, by doing informational interviews with people who are just a few years out. And then Cynthia or Trish, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would agree, and I think it's important that you remember that sometimes the people that are a bit further on, they might not have gotten there in the strategic way that we're talking about in this webinar. I know I didn't get to my position in a strategic way, so it might not be a path that you would want to take. So people that are closer to you might and, and where you want and they are where you want to be might be a little bit more useful. Great, thank you, Trish. So let's take a look at these um, at the survey results. Uh, I'm I'm surprised actually to see that so many people have recognized that an undersized personal network is one of the uh, things that they need to one gap that they need to fill. Uh, thankfully, that's a fairly simple process. It does take time, though. Uh, and those of you who um, I encourage everyone to utilize LinkedIn, which is a great um, online way of developing and keeping track of your network. Um, some other ways that you can increase your personal network are uh, by going to conferences, by just getting out and doing things in the scientific community, and by doing site visits and informational interviews if you have that, especially site visits if you have that opportunity at the school that you're at. If you don't have that opportunity or if the, that opportunity hasn't been provided already, um, I would encourage you to talk to your dean of graduate studies or to the, your postdoc office or to an office that um, is tasked with, um, with professional development, career development, and see if you can help to set up uh, some site visits uh, if, that, if there are local options. Those are a great way to increase your network and to learn more about what's going on. And we've found at UNC that the uh, companies that are local here are more than happy to set aside an afternoon for talking with trainees. Okay, others are meager publication record. We all wish we had another first author publication, uh, and that uh, uh, um, is, alludes to the importance that Cynthia put uh, at the beginning 
uh, that all of this career planning and career awareness, um, act, all of these activities need to be done with an eye on maintaining your research productivity. All right. Are there any questions that relate, Erica, that you've seen that relate to this poll or to these gaps? Or, or what other kind of things have people written into the chat box for other gaps? Sure. Just a second. I'm looking for that particular thing. Um, so Courtney does write, she has a BS in biology, and she didn't, she wasn't able to get research experience as an undergraduate to determine if she would like to continue on in research as a career path. And so her advisor has advised her that she could go ahead and apply to some PhD programs to get that experience, um, but she's still undecided about whether she wants to do that, and she's no longer eligible for undergrad research or internships. So she's wondering if there are short-term opportunities for her to gain research experience that she could fill that in in one of her gaps um, versus apply, like going into graduate school. Yeah, that's a great question. So there certainly are. Um, a couple that come to mind are the NIH post -back program. Uh, and Trish, I'm sure that you can uh, fill us in on that. But it's a, uh, I believe it's a one-year uh, opportunity that's available to um, any uh, rising researcher or, or student who's in, or um, post back who's interested in research. And basically it's a, a year-long program at the NIH where you're doing uh, lab work full-time uh, and getting ready to apply to graduate school or in your case um, trying to decide if that is what you, if that is the career path that you want to go. Um, there are, for, for students who are from underrepresented groups, there's also a a similar post back program that's called the PrEP program, uh, and those are available at many different institutions. It's an NIH funded program. And there's also opportunities to basically be a technician in a research laboratory at the, um, if there's a, a research institution in your hometown, you can either volunteer or oftentimes get paid to be a technician uh, in a research laboratory. Yeah, this is Cynthia. I would chime in and, and encourage you to just consider getting a job and trying it out and see what you think and consider it maybe it's a, a real true job that you'll stay in for a while or maybe it ends up being a transition experience, but you'll develop skills and, and professional experience which will be helpful to you and, um, and you'll also uh, better get to know how much uh, you want research to be part of your professional role. Um, increasingly, well, I don't know, our institution um, does like to see research experience in the lab, and so having a job does not, does not take you out of the running for graduate school in any way. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. The, the other thing I would add, too, is that these programs that Patrick is citing are quite competitive, so it's always good to have a plan A, a plan A prime, and maybe a plan A double prime when you're um, going forward with some of those options. And this is Suzanne. The only thing I would add is I would certainly not, not go to graduate school if you have not had experience in research. I think you want to make sure that you want to go the grad, graduate school path before you sign on to a, um, onto a graduate program. I would definitely agree. This is Cynthia, and I want to chime in too. Those of you undergraduates, you should have career centers um, that are very useful on your campus. And so make an appointment and go talk to a career counselor, um, uh, and they can have, make a lot of really good suggestions to you as well, as well as helping you make that transition or find a position in the next step. I think we have a few other questions, but I think I'll hold those toward the end um, and let us progress a little bit more, and we'll see if we have any other questions as the time goes on. Thank you. That sounds good. So I, will, um, I have two more slides here with some ideas of different ways that you can fill some of your skill gaps. These tend to have, um, when, I, when I came up with these ideas, they're mostly for the graduate um, student and postdoc population, so keep that in mind as you're looking over them. But um, so step three in this, iterative process is to set goals to fill or to bridge the gaps that you've identified. Um, depending on what the gaps are that you have, here are some uh, options for how to fill those gaps. Most of these don't take much effort and can be done with, um, while still maintaining research productivity. I'll go to the next slide which has some more opportunities. And the title of this slide is alluding to the, the need that when you're taking, in order to take control of your career path, 
uh, you really have to create your own opportunities. It's rare that you'll find uh, a program that's already in place that's going to give you, uh, that's going to help you to bridge the exact um, gap that you have. Uh, and so you do have to think strategically and think about ways that you can take advantage of opportunities, local opportunities, and of uh, the network that you've created in order to be able to do some of these act, uh, activities as an example to bridge your skill gaps or your, your gaps. Um, so the next slide is going to be um, sending it back to Cynthia to talk a little bit more about following through on the plan, but I think this is a good stopping point to see if we have any questions that are related to gaps or filling gaps or, or finding ways to make your own opportunities. Is, do we have anything like that? So we have one question that asks, what are the essential technical skills required for a career in a, in a bi biomedical industry? That may be a little bit of a broad question for this, but do you want to speak to that, Patrick? Sure, I can, I can try that one. Um, so the industry is, when we talk about technical skills, every employer, every industry experience is going to be different. They're going to be looking for something very specific normally. Uh, and so I, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Uh, usually you can find that information pretty readily in the job description. Uh, if I could um, change that question slightly to what are some of the skills that are valued by industry across the board, um, then that may also be of benefit to the, to the question, the person who's asking the question. And what I have found, and, and I will lean on Cynthia and Trisha's experience and Erica's experience and Suzanne's also, uh, anybody who wants to chime in, but industry basic, often is looking for uh, people who have team-based science experience. Uh, even though we like to think that our labs are collaborative and that our research projects are collaborative within, uh, within our labs, it's really a very different structure than industry science and there's much more collaboration between groups that takes place and so any time that you can show that you've initiated collaborations and, and led collaborations or at least been a part of a collaborative team uh, where you're waiting on one another for um, deadlines uh, and, and keeping in, in mind the, the deadlines of the project and how your individual piece um, fits in, that's an important skill that's valued in, in industry as is uh, communication skills, uh, clear writing skills, ability to write to uh, uh, and, and convey the, the progress of a project to a wide variety of different audiences is also another one. Um, so, so that's great. I'm going to use that as a transition to thinking back about your planning. Um, so, so Patrick's walked you through kind of, you know, briefly thinking we're going you know, on a fast pace here, thinking about your long-term career goals um, and also identifying your gaps. And the ideas here on his slide about creating your opportunities, I think, you know, and on this prior slide, bring up the point that there are many different things that you can do. And you may be feeling like you can identify lots of areas where you need to improve or that you need more experience or where your network needs to expand. And so, Yes, you may feel a little bit overwhelmed that there are many things you could work on. I think it comes down to this is where the IDP process is very, very helpful to kind of brainstorm what, where your gaps are, um, but then really decide on prioritizing. Right? So okay, sure, my writing skills could be better, but actually they're pretty good. Um, but where I really, really need some help is expanding my network in, in industry. Right? So prioritizing for yourself what you think will be most important um, to spend your time doing. And then for those goals, developing an action plan. And, um, and these ideas on this slide here from Patrick are good examples um, of some of the actions that you might decide to take. But there are many, um, and that's up to you. So once you have an action plan, even that action plan, sometimes in our courses, students and postdocs look at the action plan and think, my goodness, how am I going to get this all this done? And I want to acknowledge that that is part of the process, I think, is feeling the kind of that fear and intimidation. Um, and, but there's something to remember, which is that you were already probably thinking that you wanted to accomplish these things in your mind. Um, and a good reality check is, ah, maybe I can't do all of these, let's prioritize, or ah, I need to work really hard and I'm really determined to accomplish these goals, so this is how I'm going to do it. Um, so part of this might be thinking about how are you going to follow through on your plan? How can you increase the chances that you will follow through and 
work hard to meet new people in industry, et cetera. Some of these things can be difficult to do. Um, so there are some strategies, that, and some of these strategies come from um, research that's been done in psychology and other fields around goal setting, you know, broadly beyond the sciences for years, right? Um, and so there's some general principles that I want to share with you. One is to write down your goals. Um, and IDP, some institutions are, you know, many institutions are requiring students to do IDPs. NIH expects um, principal investigators who are paying graduate students or postdocs on their grants to report whether or not they have their students do IDPs. I want to encourage you when you think about this plan to actually write down your goals and write down the actions you'll take and get to the point where you can at least uh, map it onto a timeline roughly. This really gets you to be more specific about what you're going to do, which will enhance the chances that you'll follow through and do it. And it really lowers the activation energy barrier to, to following through. So be more specific about the actions you'll take. And also as you're planning, think about how you're going to hold yourself accountable. This is especially important for any professional development goals. Um, your principal investigator or research advisor is likely to hold you accountable to following through on your experiments and your research. Um, if you take a course, you have to complete the course and take an exam on time. But when you're deciding for yourself that you want to improve your writing skills, or when you're deciding for yourself you want to be better at managing people or develop your network, there might not be someone to hold yourself accountable, and it might be easy for you to decide this is important but not urgent right now and not follow through. And then you might come to the end of your training and realize you don't know anyone in industry and that's going to be a problem. So think about ways that maybe you can find other friends who have similar goals and you could check in with each other just five minutes once a week at lunchtime about what you've learned about industry. Maybe just do that for a few months to get yourselves going. There's a lot of different creative ways you can think about for holding yourself accountable. In my IDP, if you Google my IDP articles, there's a collection of articles that we, my IDP authors, wrote to um, to complement my IDP. And there's a section in there for goal setting, and it includes some tips for holding yourself accountable. Other things around following through on your plan. I found it really helpful to list the goals or actions you'll take chronologically, to look at your plan by semester or by month and say, hmm, is that really going to be realistic for August? I was thinking I'd also take vacation during that time. How can I also expand my network and submit a grant you know, and prepare for teaching next semester? Um, so that can be very helpful and be a reality check. Um, I also found it really helpful to have my IDP kind of be on a single sheet of paper. It's my bigger picture plan for the year um, by month or by semester. But then I take those certain milestones that I've identified and I put them on my day-to-day -day calendar, which I happen to use an electronic calendar. Um, and then week by week I can map my tasks to, me to help me reach those milestones. You're going to need some resources probably to follow through on your plan. You might need access to equipment. You might need money or time off to take a course in scientific writing. You might need some resources to get, be able to go to a conference in regulatory affairs because that's something you're really interested in and you want to network with professionals who do that. Um, so think about what resources you might need ahead of time. And then think creatively about how you might attain those resources or ask for help. Um, you'd be surprised about how mentors might be willing to help you. Uh, for example, my mentor um, uh, off ended up paying for me to go to a conference directly related to my career goals, not related to my research. And um, we did that um, because I told him, you know what, let me see if I can get some funding otherwise to go to a scientific conference that you would have been paying for anyway, um, and then you could open the door for me to go to this other conference. There's some creative solutions to some of these resource needs. Another thing you might want to consider, which I find really helpful, is when you discuss your IDP with a mentor or check in with somebody about your goals, schedule at that time a check-in meeting for three or six months later. Their calendar will probably be open, which is convenient. Um, and if you have that meeting on paper, it will automatically build into your timing a time to check in and think about your plan again. That will help hold you accountable to planning and moving forward in your career. And something that can be of use as you're going through this process. You can just do it all on paper or on a whiteboard or whatever it is. Um, but if it, many people do find it helpful to have a framework to take them through the career exploration process to identifying, kind of bringing more focus to your long-term career goals, identifying your gaps and setting goals. My IDP is a resource that's been mentioned already multiple times, and I'll share that with you. Um, the American Chemical Society recently came out with Chem IDP, which is very similar to my IDP um, and is more chemistry oriented. So there are some frameworks coming out. Let me introduce you to my IDP. 
um, briefly, um, and, uh, and then we'll kind of summarize and take some questions further. Um, so my IDP we designed because we felt that this was a very important process to help students and postdocs go through, but that the concept was sometimes difficult to do yourself, and that a framework was very, very helpful. So because many graduate students and postdocs have difficulty identifying what their long-term career goals might be, we decided to make uh, basically half of my IDP focused on that part, defining your long-term career goal. And then the second half is more about the goal setting. So in each section, there's a quick tips that section and a link to an article that you might want to look at to get more information. I'm just going to briefly point out some of the features and how these features align with some of the things that Patrick and I have been sharing with you during this webinar. So Patrick mentioned that knowing yourself and doing some self-reflection is very important. There's an assessment section of my IDP. This is showing the skills assessment section. Um, and um, let me see if I can pull up an arrow here. I'm not sure if you can see this arrow. I'm going to assume that you can. Um, yes. yeah, great. You'll notice that um, we uh, define skills that were commonly used by PhD um, graduate students and postdocs um, in the sciences. So again, undergraduate students, you may or may not find this as helpful. Um, but you know, make your own list of skills to add to this or talk to a mentor if you'd like to. Um, there's also an interest inventory and a values inventory. And uh, these these can be very, very helpful. As Patrick said, you can start with these multiple choice and then, then kind of look at your CV and think bigger picture. Yeah, what, what have I really enjoyed doing? What do I feel like I've been good at in the projects I've already experienced? Any of these exercises can help you do this self-reflection and assessment. Um, the values can be very important. And as you look at your values, I want to encourage you to be um, very discerning um, in deciding what, what really are your top values. In this section, under the career exploration section, we, many people have found this section and really loved it in my IDP. It provides a list of, I believe, 16 different career path categories, um, somewhat similar to what we used in the poll today. Um, I, don't, I think this is very valuable and maybe highlighting for you careers you might not have thought about before. And in the read about careers section right here, linking you to resources immediately so that you can start looking, learning about those career paths. What I want to encourage you not to do is use this as a prediction as to whether you'll be successful in these careers. That's not what it's intended to do. Um, and we, were not, we did not have the resources to hire psychometricians, for example, to really refine this tool. And so um, you know, take it with a grain of salt and just use it as a helpful resource. I wouldn't read very much, um, you know, in, read very much into these numbers. But I would suggest that you click on one of those numbers because one of those, um, then you'll be able to see how your skills match, for example, with becoming a principal investigator in a research intensive institution, which is one of the career paths listed. And you can start to identify where some of your gaps might be between where you've rated yourself in green and what career advisors who are familiar with these career paths have said might be more important for this career. Again, this is not a perfect assessment. It's not intended to be. It's intended to be a self-reflection tool, uh, one more tool that you can use to think through these things. Um, in the Read About Careers section, you can use this section to identify um, ways that you can start to fill some of these gaps. Um, some people use this section to learn more about a career path. So for example, you might learn about what it's like to be a science writer. Um, other people, for example, for becoming a faculty member at a university or college, you might know a lot about that. You can use the articles and books here to then think about how to, to uh, fill your gaps. Um, what are the important skills that I'll need, and how can I start preparing now to fulfill them? There were a number of questions earlier about informational interviews. I wanted to point out that networking is very, very important, and that we have a talk to people section <laughs> dedicated to this. There's a tab that gives pointers for how to expand your network, and there's a helpful article that we wrote for this that's also linked there. And there's also a tab on informational interviews and an article that describes how to do an informational interview and specific questions that you might um, download here um, that are general questions you might ask to structure that conversation, as Trish was suggesting, or looking at um, specific questions related to your most important values. That's those. Um, for the goal setting, there's a goal setting section. Um, we have some ideas for how to improve this section, so we're excited about that. But for right now, a really great advantage of this goal setting section is you can type in the goal that you have, the action you want to take, um, give it some kind of time frame. It doesn't have to be exact. 
Um, but then the computer will basically take all the goals that you've entered, and in this final report that you look at, it will give you a summary that organizes the goals by month. And it doesn't just show the milestones, but it shows you, well, you're going to start working towards that goal in February, and you're going to finish in May. And so that goal will, or action will appear in each one. And I think that's really helpful. It, you know, I used to do this by hand in a Microsoft Word, so I love that the computer can generate it automatically. Um, I'm going to go backwards one. You can get this summary um, at, in the Implement Plan section. And so when you click there, you can decide what part of your My IDP um, progress you want to print out, and you can bring parts of it to a career counselor, to your a mentor, to someone you, you're doing having a conversation with, or just print it for your own use. And then if you want to, you can opt to have a monthly email reminder sent to you that shows the, t the goals that you are working towards, the goals that are coming up for this month. And if you um, update the goal through this link, then you can check off a box that you have completed the goal, and it will no longer include that in your um, monthly email. So that's a quick overview of my IDP as one tool you can use for this. Um, we hope that you found this webinar helpful. I think there are some things that, messages that we want to get across for you. Um, uh, as you leave, right? As you progress through your training, through your career, this is a lifelong career type of thing you should be doing, is really making time for your professional development. How do you want to grow as a professional? What direction do you want to head in? And how, to, how can you kind of advocate for yourself and ensure that you're taking that time for your own professional development? In doing this strategically, it's helpful to consider your long-term career options and, you know, um, careers are pretty tight, and so it it's, would be strategic to take a more focused route and think about how you can prepare for those careers. So to do that, identify your gaps, learn about the careers out there, identify your gaps, and address those gaps as part of your individual development plan. So take some time to reflect on these types of things, create a thoughtful plan for the year, and come back to that plan periodically to revise it. And if you want to, take a different type of route separate from your plan, um, but to make that as a deliberate decision. As you do this and take action on your plan, you know, feel empowered to advocate for yourself. Watch for lucky opportunities. Uh, ah, I didn't realize I could get teaching experience that way. That would be really perfect. And then edit your plan. Having a plan allows you to better um, identify and notice lucky opportunities when they do come up. And make sure that you reach out to mentors, get mentorship, um, engage with multiple mentors. Don't rely only on one mentor because many people's different perspectives can be helpful. Um, and so we're going to stay to answer questions, and, and we can do that formally here. Maybe Suzanne, you can highlight, or um, Erica, you can highlight some questions that have come up if there are any. Um, but I want to thank um, NIH Best and especially ASBMB for um, hosting uh, this webinar series and having us here today. Oh, I want to point out too on this final slide are the websites for Patrick's program and for my program, um, and we both have a lot of resources on our websites. Um, as an example, at career.umassmed.edu, we've, uh, we've created web pages with um, deeper resources um, and ways to think about you know, ideas that you can bring into your plan um, for uh, groupings of my IDP career paths for scientists. So I want to welcome you to take advantage of our resources on either one of our websites. Thank you, Cynthia, and special thanks to Patrick and Suzanne as well, and also to Trish uh, for answering questions. So in case anyone needs to leave here right at 2, I'd just like to tell you that in a few hours these slides will be downloadable from the ASBMB website. And you'll also be able to re-watch the webinar or send the webinar to other people to watch if you would like to. We have the full recording that will be available also at the ASBMB website in the same place that you registered. Um, also one other note, so for the presenters who mentioned websites, we've had several requests to put those websites in the downloadable slides. So if any of the websites that were mentioned, those will be available in the slides. But presenters, please uh, email me the URLs for those websites so I can add them. And then it looks like we have several questions coming in. Um, so first, Suzanne had mentioned that we might want to talk a little bit about uh, master's versus doctoral programs, in re especially in regards to careers outside of academia. Patrick, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Um, one, there's, I don't know how specific this is to North Carolina, but um, both at North Carolina State University as well as at a couple of the UNC schools, there's, and, and I actually I know that this is not just a, a U, uh, North Carolina uh, program, but professional science master's programs uh, are becoming more popular and they're 
usually um, specific to very deep, very specific career paths. So, um, for example, there's a data science professional science master's program at UNC Chapel Hill, and there's a toxicology professional science master's. And both of these these are examples of, of programs that are um, usually a year or a year and a half. I think some of them may be two years. Um, they do not have a research component to them, so they are not uh, appropriate for people who want to do research afterward. But they are appropriate for um, trainees who want to get into, especially the health field, that, uh, and do some of the scientifically uh, rigorous careers that are not at the bench. Great. Um, our second question comes from Ravinder, and the question is, do you have any suggestion for improving time management skills? Um, you can take whole workshops on improving your time management skills. Um, so I think a lot of the principles that we talked about in terms of following through on your plan and such can help with time, well, it can help with project management, I guess, and keeping yourself accountable. Um, in terms of time management, one I can share with you one, one trick that I have, and maybe Suzanne and Trish or um, Patrick, you can chime in. Um, well, you know, when I transitioned to my first role away from the bench, I realized that there were the type of multitasking I would need to do was pretty different from what I did as a graduate student and postdoc. And so I asked, what I did was I talked to a number of colleagues and asked, you know, how they manage their time and how they, you know, keep track of the different projects and where they are on different projects. One of my colleagues um, used a special type of sticky note. So it was, this is all that she used this type of sticky for. And she wrote down her to-dos on the sticky note. Um, and so I tried that for a little while. And for me, I, did, I found that it didn't work because I tended to lose the sticky note, first of all. <laughs> um, or it was too easy to ignore for me to ignore the sticky note. And I found that I was using my computer and electronic calendar more often. What I found for myself, so, so I guess the main point is everyone's different, and I think it was really helpful to ask different colleagues for ideas. The idea that I ended up settling on that helps me is um, I put large milestones or I, things from my own IDP on my calendar and have big planning meetings occasionally with my team right? Um, when we need to, when we're at a transition, when things have changed, or just annually to make sure we're doing that. Um, once I get those milestones on my calendar, then um, each week I'm kind of aware of, okay, this milestone is coming up. What do I need to be doing? What tasks and actions do I need to take on a daily basis to accomplish that? And what I do is I actually put those actions on my calendar uh, because everything you do takes time. And so it's not just meetings on my calendar, but my actual to-dos. Um, and so each, at the end of each day before I leave my office, I check my list, I delete the items that I've already done from my calendar for that day, and the things that I didn't do, I read them, it's a reminder to me, and I physically move them by my mouse, I drag them to the next day or to another day when I'll work on that. And what I found is that I'm just, I'm forgiving to myself, I deliberately think about whether that was okay that I did not do that yet or not, and then I, um, and then if I find that I drag it to do too many times, then that pushes me to just do it and get it done. I, I want to add that I think that that's a, a really important skill, the time management one, and that is one that we saw coming back time and time again as something that people outside academia, when they're hiring trainees, they often claim or they often say that that is something that they're, the trainees that they're hiring are not good at. So, um, you know, whatever tricks work for you, I think it's important to work on it and recognize that it's an important skill. And, um, you know, just like when you're working in the lab, it's not important how many hours you put in or that you stay at, until midnight. What's important is what you do during the hours you are there. So I think it's a very important skill to get a handle on. So kudos um, to working on that. We have one other uh, question, but if anyone that's still on the webinar would like to ask a question, please go ahead and type that in the chat box. If I don't get any more by the time we're done with this next question, we'll probably go ahead and sign off. Um, so, so Suzanne also thought it might be worth commenting on uh, the role of professional coaches and what all of the different, what do the speakers think about using a professional coach? 
I'll say that I haven't worked with a professional coach myself. And so, um, Patrick, do you want to address that question? Or maybe, Suzanne, you have some comments about that? Yeah, I don't have any, I don't have much experience, either personal experience or uh, I haven't been training to professional coaches before. So, so I can define, oh, yeah. Yep. My experience, a professional coach can be potentially valuable, especially if you're aspiring to careers that are more on the administrative and leadership side. Um, they can help you to, to take the 30,000 foot view of yourself, get a sense of how you present yourself to others, and help you to hone your best skills and um, fill the gaps so that you can be a more effective leader. Yeah, so I see professional coaches as being especially valuable well, if you don't have workshops or something available on campus, I think it's a nice start to kind of do your own if you can. Um, you know, find books about leadership skills or some of these other skills um, or attend workshops. And then um, as you start to build kind of that toolbox, you can then reach out and use professional coaches to really hone your skills in the way that Suzanne mentioned. I think um, it's, you usually pay for those services, right? And so um, and you need to, we'd probably want to ask around to find the right fit for you get a recommendation for someone. We've had two additional questions. Eileen's question is, do you have any experience or advice on how students can prepare for careers in science policy? I can take that one. Um, there are lots of fellowships available for um, related to science policy. Um, one of the best known ones is the AAAS Science Policy Fellowships. Those do tend to be very competitive. But many of the societies, and maybe ASBMB also, um, have fellowships. Uh, and so that is a, a, a great way to get some science policy experience. Uh, yes, so this is Erica Sarafi. I Since I wasn't a speaker, I didn't introduce myself, but I'm one of the society's education managers. And I actually, um, when I finished grad school, I took the ASBMB Science Policy Fellowship. And I'd also recommend if you're interested in science policy to try and do a Hill Day with your professional society. So the ASBMB, for example, uh, flies out 20 grads and postdocs to participate in our Hill Day at least once a year. Um, all expenses paid, and I think other professional societies do as well. So that's, that's a little bit less of a commitment, and you can still do that while you're in grad school or as a postdoc. Um, there are also a number of other policy fellowships, and I think if you follow our policy blog, um, a couple months ago, or actually maybe a year ago, I did a post about like collating all of those together into one spreadsheet with all the deadlines and everything. Um, so I'd recommend looking at our policy blog as well. Or you can email me. I see another question that came up, um, and it's related to <laughs> the broader question of once I make a leap into one career path, is there no turning around and going back? Right? Do close, do other doors close for me? Um, you know, this is um, you know, the, the question specifically about academia and industry. But I can say that I feel like I have my own personal philosophy about this, and others can chime in. Um, I feel like doors are never closed. You can take opportunities and learn more about yourself or about those roles or gain more experience that will you know, probably benefit your perspective as you move forward with whatever career paths or actions you want to take. Um, an internship in industry specifically, and will doing an internship in industry decrease your chances of getting a faculty position? Uh, I would say I can't imagine that being true. I think if you wanted to become faculty at a smaller college, you might want to highlight that as being something that you've experienced that some of your students might be interested in doing. If you want to go to a research intensive institution, um, you know, I suppose if you didn't want to include that on your CV, I don't think you're necessarily under an obligation to include that short internship. Um, I think um, you know, there's a, there's a way to tell a career narrative uh, if you want to, to show that these were deliberate decisions that you made to broaden your perspectives and to learn more about science. And so I think, um, you know, an internship is not something I would be very concerned about. On the other hand, if the internship disrupts the momentum of your research, that's something to think about, right? Um, if, um, if you're talking about becoming, you know, going into industry for five to ten years and then coming back to fa being a faculty member, I've seen, you know, several examples of that happening very successfully. I think any time you're shifting between different types of environments or settings with different types of values, um, and industry and academia can, are pretty different in a lot of ways, um, that can be difficult in either direction. Right? It's difficult as a postdoc, for example, to move into industry initially, and it could be difficult moving from industry to academia. But again, I think you'd do that strategically and create an individual development plan to really think about how you can make that transition happen. And, and I think another thing to keep in mind, um, 
this may not resonate with you if you're very young, but when you get to my stage in your career, you realize that by the time you retire, there will likely be career paths out there that we can't even imagine now. And so chances are that you, you, will be, you will have to be nimble at some point in your career. And that's where deliberate planning and ensuring that you keep your skill set sharp, um, changing when the wind changes a bit become very, very important. Yeah, I, I think pursue the careers right now that you're excited about, um, you know, that fit with your values, right? So it may have the right salary for you, whatever your needs are or interests are. Um, and, you know, just recognize that, sure, you might need to work to transition later, but, but I don't think doors are ever absolutely shut. You can, you can show how you as a unique candidate will bring a special value to that next position. I, I would agree with that as someone who has changed, who went from academia into government, you know, an IH job administration. Um, the experience that I had on both levels really added to what people wanted from me in different places. So it's actually been a plus, I think. Yeah, and this question was specifically about an internship. I would say you should go for the internship so that you know, um, so that you can feel more. If you have that opportunity, or if you can make that happen, you'll feel more confident about your next steps in your career. That it's a good fit for you. Um, so I wouldn't worry about any consequences of that in that regard. The only consequence is the one that Cynthia already cited, which is to make sure it doesn't interfere with your productivity and that your mentor is on board. Um, Patrick had to leave, but I can stay for a couple more minutes to address questions. I think that was our last question. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Kim asks, in terms of science policy, who, oh, the, who's the person that suggested we email them? So I'll email her back um, separately. So I think that unless we have any other questions, I'll give you maybe 15 seconds uh, to type in a one final question. Suzanne has also left, so final questions for Cynthia or Trish, um, and then we will end. But I will remind everyone that the slides will be downloadable later to today from the ASCMB website, and the recorded um, webinar will be available probably tomorrow, not this afternoon, but tomorrow from the ASCMB website as well. So special thanks to all of our presenters. and. Um, yes, so David, your question just asked, thank you for asking that question. As soon as I end this, you will be sent to a survey. Please fill out that survey for us. It will help us um, create good webinars for you in the future. And if you don't have time now, I'll send a reminder about that survey tomorrow. All right, thank you very much.